In Leaving Neverland, a new documentary on HBO, two men who say singer Michael Jackson abused them as children share their stories. Wade Robson and James Safechuck say that they hid their stories of abuse for years, though Jackson's family vehemently denies the allegations. Each has sued the Jackson estate. The suits were dismissed due to the statute of limitations, but they are appealing. Here's a preview. I was seven years old. Michael asked, do you and the family want to come to Neverland? We drive in and forget about all your problems. You were in Neverland. It was a fantasy. The days were filled with magical childhood adventure experiences. Playing tag, watching movies, eating junk food, anything you could ever want as a child. It's like hanging out with a friend that's more your age. Jackson repeatedly denied similar abuse claims before his death in 2009, and now his estate is suing HBO over the documentary, calling it a one-sided marathon of unvetted propaganda. The family has also attacked Robson and Safechuck, personally calling them, quote, opportunists and admitted liars. So Dan Reed is the director and producer of Leaving Neverland, and he is here with us now. Hi. Hi. Good to see you. So Thank we you. both had an opportunity to see the documentary uh, ahead of this weekend, and it's intense, it's emotional, mm -hmm. it's, it's pretty heavy. Mm -hmm. It is actually not your typical documentary topic. So why did you choose to do this? I chose to, I mean, I stumbled across Wade and James in the course of trying to understand what the Michael Jackson's story had been all about. I hadn't really taken an interest in Michael Jackson or the allegations of sexual abuse against him. And, you know, but this, what this has in common with the other stories I've done is that it's a very, a story that's out there in the public. A lot of people mm -hmm. know that there are allegations against Michael um, in the same way that a lot of people knew about the terrorist attack in Nairobi, for instance, but people- You did a documentary on that, yeah, right. For HBO. Um, but what I, think is important to do as a documentarian is to try and take people inside the complex truth that lies behind a story that the public think they kind of know. But in this case, there was so much more to say. So let's uh, get this up front and center because you've addressed this uh, with others who've asked this question. Uh, the controversy surrounding your decision not to include interviews from the Jackson family, perhaps even his children, what do you say to those critics and how do you defend that as a documentarian, as a journalist? So we don't make any allegations about the Jackson family or about the estate or about his children. We make allegations, well, Wade and, Ray, Wade and James, Wade and James make allegations about their sexual abuse at the hands of Michael Jackson. And because Michael's not, allowed, not around to defend himself, we included the things that he said while he was alive in his defense. And we gave that a lot of space in the film. And we put his lawyers, Mark Garagos, and Johnny Cochran, Tom Mesereau, they're in the film, and they're in the film, you know, more than once. Um, and so, and, and Michael's there defending himself, saying his interest in kids was innocent and that he would never hurt a child. And, you know, we see him get acquitted. So there's, there's plenty in there that voices the, the views and the opinions and the rebuttals of the Jackson camp. You have to remember that the Jacksons are defending a very valuable asset, you know, the estate, its lawyers are defending a hugely uh, precious and valuable asset. Um, and, and their interest is in suppressing this story and in sliming the people who are coming out saying, well, we were abused as children by, by Michael. So the first thing uh, people are going to say when they hear, or may, some people will say when they hear that the stories are coming from these two gentlemen, is that, you know, they've changed their story. They defended him for years. Mm. Uh, the Jackson family is saying they're after the money. Of course, they deny all of that. But what did you do sort of independently as a filmmaker to verify their version of events? Well, I don't think even the Jackson family deny that Michael spent night after night after night with little boys in his bed. And I don't think they deny that Wade Robson and James Safechuck were two of those little boys. Mm -hmm. They're both seen, and the documentary record is extensive. They're both seen with him hand in hand, etc. And everyone knows that they spent nights together. Now, what's at issue here is what happened behind those closed doors of the bedroom, of the hotel rooms that they stayed in. And there are only two witnesses to that, because never in any of the interviews that they gave me did Wade or James say there was a third person lurking in the corner. Mm. There never was. Jermaine wasn't there. Mm. Tito wasn't there. OK, so we have the, the 
then little boys, the seven-year-old Wade, we have him now as an adult telling us in graphic detail that's excruciatingly, you know, potentially embarrassing from a grown man to say all these horrible things that were done to him. Um, and we have Wade as an adult saying, I was in love with my abuser. That's also excruciatingly difficult to say. We have their mothers saying, I delivered my little boy into the hands of a predatory pedophile who I thought was like a son to me, who I loved, who I looked after. I did his washing, I cooked for him, you know, all that stuff. So these are not easy things to go on television and speak about. Um, no, and, and it's not. And you can already tell that we've been privy to seeing the documentary, uh, the documentary before it airs. But uh, a lot of people are already responding online on social media. As you know, social media is going to social media. And uh, there's been some backlash or some people um, who are praising it as well. Uh, but I wonder, how do you see and I know it's not necessarily the job of a documentarian to think about that. But how do you see the landscape changing in terms of people who've grown up with Michael Jackson, who've listened to his music even before he was a solo artist. Do you see, are you anticipating a difference in the way people will perceive his legacy after the film airs? I think people who watch the film will feel differently about his music. And that was not something that I intended because my aim was to tell Wade and James's story and the story of their families and the story of why Wade changed you know that that's the thing at the center of this is like why did you lie on the witness stand you defended michael you were defense witness number one you were amazing you were one of the reasons why he didn't go to jail mm -hmm. and now you're telling a story which is completely contradictory to that so that was and, and i think when you understand that story you also understand something very important about ch child sexual abuse which is this deep connection and and deep attachment between the abuser and the victim and how that lasts into adulthood and that creates this loyalty and this this lie this silence and the secret that's never spoken. So my aim was to do that, not to topple Michael from his position as the King of Park. He's, he's an amazing entertainer and a great performer. And that, you know, those achievements remain. But Michael the man was a very flawed and ha man and had a lot of problems. And he did very cruel things to children. And he did it consistently and very deliberately. This wasn't an accidental, occasional thing that he did. He consistently and deliberately had sex with little children. And I think people have to try and accommodate that with the music. Michael the man, Michael the music. So where do you stand? It's an interesting discussion. Mm -hmm. uh, Dan Reed, thank you so much for stopping by. We appreciate it very much. Cool. Thank you. Leaving Neverland airs Sunday, March 3rd, and on Monday, March 4th on HBO.